Good afternoon. My name is Vineet Edipuganti. I'm a senior at Oregon Episcopal School in Portland. And for my research, I investigated the fascinating area of transient or biodegradable electronics. So that concept probably sounds a little bit counterintuitive because traditionally, we place a lot of emphasis on durable, long-lasting devices. But devices that can degrade intentionally over time using biologically and environmentally compatible materials can actually have a lot of applications, from environmental sensors to consumer electronics. Let me give you a specific example in the field of medicine. So right now, there are lots of problems that arise from infections in the gastrointestinal tract of the human body. So imagine a pill that could be ingested, and as it travels to the GI tract, dynamically transmits information before dissolving effortlessly over the next 24 hours. That type of real-time monitoring can provide invaluable information to health providers and patients alike. And alternatively, the pill could have a controlled release system of medication, almost like a pharmacy on a chip. In any case, this is all very fascinating, but at the heart of any transient electronic device lies the battery, which serves as a biodegradable power source. And for that reason, I wanted to focus my efforts specifically on this essential component, with my goals being to fabricate, test, characterize, and model a biodegradable battery. So first things first, what are biodegradable batteries? Well, they're two terminal devices, just like their non-biodegradable counterparts with an anode, cathode, and electrolyte. And they are primary batteries, meaning that they cannot be recharged under any circumstances. So the first really major decision I had to make was what materials I was gonna use. And I ultimately settled on magnesium and iron as my anode and cathode respectively, because they're both biodegradable, biocompatible metals with advantageous electrochemical properties. Magnesium has a very negative reduction potential of negative 2.34 volts, while iron can serve as a site for water reduction, which is important because the underlying mechanism for battery operation is the cathodic protection of iron the more noble metal, meaning that magnesium corrodes preferentially during discharge. And I chose to use phosphate buffered saline, or PBS, as my electrolyte in testing because of its similarity in composition to human body fluid, and I later tested with seawater as well. So right here, you can see a depiction of the fabrication process I developed. And what's really cool about this process is that it's cheap, non-toxic, and highly scalable. I started off with a silicon substrate, on top of which I spin-coated chitosin, which served as a biodegradable substrate. Separately, a magnesium spiral and contact mask were laser cut. I sputter deposited the iron cathode through the contact mask before placing the spiral within the iron ring. And the areas of both electrodes were defined as 0.8 centimeters squared, uh, although this can be changed. So to actually test the fabricated devices, I performed galvanostatic discharge tests at various current levels, essentially obtaining a curve of voltage with respect to time that allowed me to figure out important criteria, such as energy, capacity, and power for all of the devices. And at first, I examined behavior at three specific current levels, 25, 100, and 250 micrograms. And what I found was really interesting. As the current level increased, so too did the capacity, shown in blue, and the power, shown in red. And this was certainly encouraging, but at the same time, the results fell a little bit short of requirements for most applications, and I kept thinking that there had to be a way to improve. You see in the image on the left the degree to which the magnesium spiral was corroding. And while I expected this based on the way the battery is supposed to operate, I kept thinking that if I could somehow reduce the rate of this phenomenon, I might see better performances. And I really had two main methods of doing this. I could try and coat the surface with some type of polymer to reduce the rate of corrosion, or I could look to a slightly different material composition altogether. So in keeping with that second idea, I decided to use an alloy. Just like steel is much more resistant to corrosion than pure iron, I was hoping that magnesium alloy AZ31, which is a biocompatible alloy currently used in medical implants comprised of 3% aluminum and 1% zinc, would be better than pure magnesium. And my rationale behind this was that a layer of aluminum oxide, which is known to be a very tenacious material, would form on the surface 
serving as protection, but would also be thin enough on the order of nanometers to allow for charge transfer to continue. But to see if this hypothesis was valid, I used the exact same fabrication process, simply interchanging magnesium and magnesium alloy. And all of a sudden, I had brand new devices to test and compare to my original ones. And what I found was really striking. Even though the voltages were fairly comparable, the device lifetimes for the alloy-based batteries were over six times those of the pure magnesium ones. And what that meant was that even though power stayed the same, capacity and energy both increased drastically, meaning that the capacity, energy, and power for the alloy-based battery surpassed those of biodegradable batteries reported in literature by over four times for capacity and two and a half times for power. And to provide some context to those numbers, most low-powered electronic systems representative of transient electronics require on the order of 10 microwatts of power versus the 67.3 outputted by the alloy-based battery. Even with the alloy, however, which is shown on the right in contrast to the magnesium on the left, a layer forms on the anode during discharge. And energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy, or EDX, showed that oxygen content increases significantly as the device operates as well. And those two pieces of insight in conjunction with the discharge reactions I showed earlier, suggests that magnesium hydroxide accumulation is ultimately responsible for the battery's termination. I was also able to confirm that my most fundamental constraint, biodegradability, was met, and the devices took roughly four days to dissolve after being discharged, as you can see in these images. I also wanted to test the applicability of the batteries, so to speak. And to do that, I tested using a seawater electrolyte and also two batteries in series in PBS. And in the seawater test, the voltage only slightly dropped to 0.24 volts versus 0.28 volts, showing the potential for this technology to be applied in marine situations, such as in the event of an oil spill where device reclamation is incredibly difficult and biodegradability is key. And in the series test, the voltage exactly doubled indicating that power can be easily scaled if necessary. Now, the last part of my project involved modeling the biodegradable battery. And this hasn't really been attempted before for a transient device, but as you can imagine, it's incredibly useful because of the difficulties of doing lots and lots of experimental testing. And since the battery was transient in nature, I decided to use an equivalent circuit approach, where the circuit here represents the battery as it discharges. And essentially what I did is I fed in a current waveform and gauged voltage response in a pulse discharge test. And with each pulse, there was degradation of the battery that the model could capture by optimizing fitting parameters at various states of charge, or SOC levels, which you can think of as the fuel gauge of the battery. And you see how close the fit ultimately was for both the magnesium and magnesium alloy devices. But how did I know that those fitting parameter values were actually being optimized at all? Well, first off, I saw that the values were changing, as you see depicted on the bottom left, which of course was a good sign. And more importantly, the cost function shown on the top left, which is the measure between experimental and model data, decreased until stabilizing. And that final stabilization indicates that the fit was as good as it could be under the given conditions. Beyond just matching experimental data though, I wanted to see if I could go one step further and actually predict device performance. So using the fitting parameters I just calculated and an input discharge current of 250 microamps, I produced a simulated discharge curve that I could compare to experimental data I collected under the same conditions. And you see how close the matchup is in the graph on left. I was also able to show that simulated discharge curves could be produced at absolutely any current input. And this is really important because what it means is that once you know the underlying behavior for your device and the according fitting parameters, as well as the requirements for current for a certain application, you can immediately gauge what device output will be. And from there, optimize to find the best configuration, whether that's two batteries in series or something along those lines, without doing lots and lots of experimental testing, which after a point can become time consuming and expensive. So use of the model really facilitates and opens up opportunities in application-based optimization. Ultimately, 
I was able to develop a process for fabricating a biodegradable battery that is cheap, non-toxic, highly scalable, and allows for the easy interchange of materials. Using magnesium alloy as the anode, the device was able to outperform those of other studies reported in literature, but over four times for capacity and two and a half times for power, while also closely matching up with requirements for low-powered electronic systems representative of transient electronics. I also developed a bottle that could intrinsically capture the transients of the battery and closely predict device behavior. And even though the amount of materials used in the device are well below what we consume on a daily basis, this work enables technology with huge potential to impact an array of crucial industries, from medicine to environmental sensing to even one day, perhaps, consumer electronics. So in the future, I'd be extremely interested in exploring other alloy materials uh, to use as an anode, as well as further down the road in developing the other components of transient systems. Here's a list of my selected references. And I'd like to thank my parents and the science teachers at my school for all their support. My mentor, Dr. Raj Solanke of Portland State University for access to facilities, equipment, and for all of his guidance. And of course, the Siemens Foundation, Discovery Education, and George Washington University for making this whole experience so amazing. Thank you all so much for listening.